Hello, this is Kimberly Wilson, and welcome to the 468th edition of Tranquility Du Jour, bringing you tranquility since 2005. Tranquility Du Jour is a series of nourishing conversations about living a full and meaningful life with doses of tranquility. To stay in the know, sign up for Love Notes to get exclusive content, personal updates, giveaways, sneak peeks, all the stuff not shared anywhere else, and access Tranquil Treasures, which is an assortment of PDFs, MP3s, and videos. You can also subscribe to Tranquility Du Jour in your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcast or Overcast. And visit KimberlyWilson.com slash podcast for more episodes and the Tranquility Du Jour podcast app. If you have a moment to pin a review over on iTunes of the podcast or Amazon, any of my books, you may just hear it on the show. So Michelle writes, I'm pretty sure I've been listening to Kimberly for at least 10 years. She is amazing and everything she does seems to come so natural. These podcasts have been my friend as I run, walk, travel, go through two pregnancies, take care of my babies, and cook in the kitchen. Thank you so much, Michelle, for writing. Then finally, share your takeaways using hashtag TDJ podcast. I love to hear from you guys and know what you're taking away from these episodes. So in this week's edition, I chat with Captain Tom Bunn, who wrote Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. Learn the difference between panic and anxiety the method he teaches, and how to connect with an unconscious procedural memory. Those of you local, join me for Pugs and Pints, October 27th in Washington, D.C. It's a fundraiser for Pigs and Pugs Project, and we give microgrants to pig sanctuaries and pug rescues around the U.S. Also, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, we've got some fun things going on. Sorry, you can probably hear Gizmo snoring in the background. And you can find information on this over in the show notes, which is at KimberlyWilson.com slash four six. Eight. Our featured guest, Tom Bunn, is a licensed clinical social worker and the author of Panic Free, which is a result of his many years of addressing flight panic in his role as an airline pilot. He is also a licensed therapist, regular contributor to Psychology Today, and a former U.S. Air Force captain who flew the Air Force's first supersonic jet fighter. Visit him online at panicfree.net. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Kimberly. So whenever I received this book from New World Library, I was so excited, which, you know, who gets excited about panic books? But I do. And I think this is an amazing book you've put into the world. Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. So tell us, what inspired you to write this amazing book? Well, it started with working with people on fear of flying. As a pilot, I thought, like other pilots who run these courses, that people just know how need to know how safe flying is. But I was surprised to find there's a lot more to it than that. Um, That this whole problem of being in a place where you can't get out, people are are concerned about panic. Uh, So. And this started back in the 1980s. And, and so now no, finding out that panic was a big problem with what's called fear of flying. It's really fear of feelings uh, in many cases. Um, I found that we had to find a solution for panic. And everything that was available didn't work. For example, cognitive behavioral therapy didn't work because on an airplane, at least, in a state of panic, a person's so overloaded they can't. Uh, apply any of the tools that we came up with based on cognitive therapy. Tried for a long time. And while trying something a little different, uh, stumbled on something that was working and over time, um, what I mean, actually several years experimenting, we got it up to about 80% in terms of being able to stop panic routinely. And with people we worked more with, we could always get up to 100% with someone who we continue to work with. So I I had never thought about working on panic on the ground. Uh, But then, I don't know why, but I just checked to see what the stats were uh, on 
ending panic on the ground with cognitive behavioral therapy, and I found out it's about 17%. I was amazed because we're running between 80 and 100%. So that's why I decided to write the book. So one piece I thought that was really interesting from your book is you mentioned that, you know, according to Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 6 million Americans have panic disorder and an estimated 4.7 of U.S. adults experience panic attacks at some point in their lives. Yet only one person in seven treated using cognitive behavioral therapy becomes panic-free, and you've had such great results with yours. So can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you're doing that's so different. What I stumbled on was actually the the two things. But the first thing was that when working with people on the airplane, I was originally thinking about how we could automatically have them switch from thinking about anxiety producing some thoughts such as takeoff or turbulence to some major event in their lives that was a big deal for them. Uh, for example, I was working with a uh, a person who had run the marathon. So I said, okay, I'm going to say a word or two about some airplane situation. Then I'm going to give you a hand signal. When I give you the hand signal, I want you to go step, 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 and take yourself fully back to the marathon. And so we did that and linked um, one anxiety-producing situation about flight after another to automatically switch her to thinking about the marathon. And she did okay. But it was hit or miss. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But what was interesting, it always worked if a person linked it to nursing a child. So something was special about that. And this was about the time that it was discovered that when a mother nurses a child, she produces a massive amount of oxytocin. And that continues all the time she's nursing, a a situation that shut down the fear system. So then the question came, what can we do other than just nursing? Not everybody does that. But there's a number of things that will produce oxytocin. So one of the ways we stop the problem with panic on the plane is stop the release of stress hormones. We can also do it on the ground uh, in subways, bridges, tunnels, high places, MRIs, things like that. By linking the things you're going to run into in those activities, to a memory of a time when you produced oxytocin. Once we set that association up, you'll just automatically produce oxytocin when you're in that situation. Interesting. Yeah. So can you give us an example? Um, You know, because I love the client examples that you have in the book. And, you know, I think for our listeners of just thinking like, oh, so whenever I'm on a plane and I'm having anxiety, if I link it to a time whenever I was actually... (laughs) in a really good place, then it helps to alleviate the panic? Well, it's not exactly a good place. It's a particular kind of good place because you see, you might think, for example, why would nature program us to be able to shut down the fear system? Because after all, the fear system protects us from danger in some ways. Kind of, It's, it's rough, but it, it, that's the intention of it. But In addition to survival, reproduction is important. And all of the situations where we produce oxytocin naturally have something to do with reproduction, such as when you hold a newborn child, oxytocin is produced that causes a feeling of bonding that makes you feel like protecting the child. So that, in a way, has something to do with reproduction. Also, males at orgasm produce oxytocin. What's that about? In order to uh nature what nature is trying to do is to cause the the male to become uh, uh, bonded with the female so that he sticks around in case there's a child that develops from this activity obviously the child's going to be better off with two people taking care of it rather than one and it's also produced in foreplay and here it's not for bonding it's for shutting down the fear of getting physically close and then an uh, interesting one is pets, particularly dogs, has been actual research with dogs that cause that has to do with oxytocin production when you interact with your dog. I think it's because the dog looks at you like a lover does. You're the only person in the world. I'm totally devoted to you. That's the way dogs look at us. And that produces oxytocin. So we can link flying or MRIs or subways or bridges by first taking each whatever activity is a challenge. 
break it down into a couple of dozen steps and then link each step one by one by one to the memory of a time when you produced oxytocin. Once you've established that in what we call unconscious procedural memory, a part of the brain that has a huge amount of memory storage capacity and also isn't bothered by stress, then when you're in this situation, even if you're stressed, unconscious procedure or memory will kick in and give you oxytocin. And let me just mention something about unconscious procedural memory because it's you might think you don't know about that if you're listening. But all of us who drive a car use unconscious procedural memory frequently. For example, if you're driving the car, having a conversation, who's driving the car? You're kind of on mental autopilot. That's unconscious procedural memory taking care of driving the car for you. Right. And you, you end up at home and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but sometimes come to think of it, you know, you've also had the experience of driving right by your exit because <laughs> the this part of the brain can do what you've been trained to do, but it doesn't make decisions. So uh, if you're having a conversation as you come up to your exit, you might not you might not take it. So walk us through then, um, you know, the piece that's most unique about this method, you know, as, a, as compared to, of course, like CBT. Well, CBT, you're, you're trying to, to say, let's, let's stay rational so that you don't overreact to what's going on. And the, the problem with that is that you're asked to do this at a time when you're first overwhelmed and secondly at that level of, of 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 stress you don't have any ability to really critique your thinking very well what happens when we're cool calm and collected we have no trouble distinguishing between something that you're perceiving something around you or something that you're remembering or something that you're imagining uh, for example if you look out the window right now you could see green leaves on trees if you thought about what did it look like six months ago, oh, no leaves on the trees. And imagination might be, hey, let me see if I can come up with purple leaves. And you could do that, but you would know what you're doing. But when you get stressed, you stop looking inward enough to, to, to sense what kind of processing is going on. And so if you start out with imagination or concern or thinking, for example, suppose you have something going on with your heart rate you think it's too high you have pounding heart you think gee i wonder if this could be a heart attack if you if you get stressed enough by if you release enough stress hormones by thinking i might be having a heart attack um you the stress hormones stop you from doing this looking inward and when you stop looking inward, you're not aware that you stopped looking inward. You'd have to have inward looking to notice that you stopped looking inward. So you don't notice it. And so you slide from, if, if what you're doing is imagining, you slide from recognizing that it's imagination or conjecture to believing it's true. Because what's happening is when you stop being able to recognize what kind of processing you're doing, whatever's in your mind becomes um, experienced as if it were reality. So this imagination, maybe I'm having a heart attack, suddenly becomes, oh my goodness, I'm having a heart attack. So that's the first piece of it. It's a life-threatening situation. The other part of panic is you can't escape. And that's the thing. You're trapped, in a way, with a heart attack because you, you're in a life-threatening situation. You can't run from it. Yeah, and so then what? So then where do we go from there? The thing that we're doing is we're stopping the release of the stress hormones that rev you up enough that you can't distinguish what kind of processing you're doing. So you do, st you see, cognitive asks you to be rational and, and recognize that, that what you might be doing is overreacting to things. Right. But that's a tall order when you've lost some of your ability to, to think clearly. But if we can keep the stress hormones down automatically, by using your uh, unconscious procedural memory to take care of you, then you stay calm enough that you don't lose the ability to recognize that what's in your mind is imagination. So we have that, that system where we 
prevent the release of stress hormones. But then we have another thing that came later. And this came as a result of um, some research by Stephen Porges. He found that when we're with other people, we pick up signals from them. And the signals come across unconsciously. And if they are benign, tend to calm us. For example, when we meet a new person, we initially get some stress hormones because the amygdala, the part of the brain that uh, releases stress hormones, anytime something new or novel or unexpected happens, some stress hormones are released to get us to pay attention to what's going on. So we can decide whether it's safe or not. So when you meet a new person, you get some stress hormones. You get a little uncomfortable, but then you say, wait a minute, the person looks okay, so you don't back off. And then if you start talking with them, you begin to pick up their signals and you feel quite comfortable. Now, in most social situations, you are physically safe, so you're getting some signals that calm you down from the other people's uh, presence. And then when you're with a friend who is a person who is non judgmental, a person who doesn't criticize you or judge you at all, now you're in a situation where you're both physically safe and emotionally safe. Most social situations, people are competitive and judgmental. But with some friends, you can feel your guard let down. And when you feel your guard let down, what's happened is the vagus nerve, that's a key component in the system that Stephen Porges talks about that calms us. When we get the right signals from a person that, are, that we're totally safe with them, the vagus nerve is stimulated. The vagus nerve goes to the heart, slows the heart rate, about 20 beats per minute, slows your breathing rate, and goes to the gut and lets the gut, the gut just completely relax. So this, this doesn't prevent the release of stress hormones, but in a way it's more valuable. It overrides the effect of stress hormones. So now we have a double-barrel approach to what we can do with a challenging situation. Break it down into steps, link each of the steps in the challenging situation to a memory of a time when we produced oxytocin. And then on the next day, perhaps practice linking each of those things that happen in the challenging situation to being with a person who is profoundly calming. Now, there are three places, Borges tells us, we pick up signals from their face, from the quality of their voice, and from their body language and touch. So, for example, if I was saying, let's link to, um, uh, let's say an MRI, we might start with uh, making an appointment. We might then go to getting in the car, going there, arriving, checking in, going to a room to change into a gown, seeing the machine, lying down at the machine, the machine moving you inside, being 25% into the machine, halfway through it, three quarters through it, and then out of it. So we would take each of those steps one by one. So we would take, for example, let's say just changing, um, changing into a robe and, and, and knowing that the machine is going to be the next step. So we'd link it to the person's face. We would imagine that person has a photograph of that scene by their face. So that's how we link that person's signals, safety signals in their face to the situation we're going to run into. But we also want to connect to the quality of their voice. So we imagine we'd look at the, at the photograph together and talk a little bit about it for just a few seconds, just to get the quality of your friend's voice, where the safety signals are connected to that subject in the photograph. And then while having that conversation, you notice your friend just gave you a hug that's reassuring. So face, voice, and touch, the three things that calm us through activating the the calming system called the parasympathetic nervous system, we link it to the challenge. So there we've got two ways now to deal with panic. Prevent the release of stress hormones with oxytocin through links to the challenging situation. Override the effect of any stress hormones through the face, voice, and touch of a calming person. And is there any way, I love the step-by-step, -step, thank you, it's so helpful, I think, if we're more kind of a, um, linear type thinkers. And so um, my, my question for you is about the vagus nerve, too. Are there other ways to stimulate that to help? Yeah, Stephen always <laughs> reminds me that breathing can do it, um, because when we exhale, we 
stimulate the vagus nerve. In fact, this is how he discovered this. He was doing some research on uh, what he calls heart rate variability. When we breathe in, we have a new supply of oxygen in the lungs. The heart speeds up to about 80 beats per minute on average. So it's now working a little harder than average to transport that oxygen through the body. A few seconds later, you exhale. Now, does the heart really need to keep beating that fast? No. So it slows down about to about 60 beats per minute. And then you inhale, go up to 80, exhale, go down to 60. So what is the um, apparatus that causes that slowdown of the heart? That's the vagus nerve. So his research initially was involved in, in determining how much change took place as a way of reflecting the quality of the nerve, which varies from person to person. So what surprised him as he was doing his research was that he had his subjects hooked up the equipment. And what surprised him was that um, when they saw a friend walk by, their heart rate would go down. And so he started looking into that. And now – he calls it the social engagement system. When we're with other people, we pick up the signals that calm us down. But the other thing that you mentioned, what else can do it? Simply exhaling. So one way you can produce relaxation is to breathe in normally and exhale very slowly so you extend the time that the vagus nerve is being stimulated. But this is not as powerful as linking to a person's face, voice, and touch, which will, as long as you have that person in mind, which could be for minutes, you could, for several minutes, cause the vagus nerve to be stimulated. Whereas if you're inhaling and exhaling, it's stimulated, non-stimulated, stimulated, non-stimulated. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it's uh, I, as you were talking about it, I was like, oh, it seems like relaxation techniques would help with the vagus nerve, too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And the thing is that, yes, when you breathe out, you're relaxing, but you got to breathe in, too. <laughs> so right. that's the trick. Right. <laughs> now, what would you say is the most important thing that a person in the midst of a panic attack needs to know or remember? That's the tricky thing. You know, you, you you find so many things on the web about what do you do in the middle of a panic attack? How can you get rid of it? You can't because you're so overloaded, you, you can't function. In fact, some people become immobile and, and can't even move like a deer in the headlights. Uh, so I think what a person really could say is – after I've had a panic attack and don't want to have another one, what can I do so that in the panic attack, since I can't function, I can get my unconscious procedural memory to function for me and get me out of it? So that's what we need to do, to train the unconscious procedural memory system to do those two things. When we're in the situation where we're having the panic, we want to have oxytocin flowing to keep us from panicking we want to have a friend's face voice and touch come to mind to activate the vagus nerve and calm us down so that what the way it really works out is we nip panic in the bud before we can really get going one of the things too that you talk about in the book is there the difference between anxiety and panic so can you um, enlighten us on that well uh, mentioned a few minutes ago about the the heart attack let's say that you might have anxiety that maybe you have heart trouble and maybe you could have a heart attack. That's a situation where you're afraid something is going to happen, but you're not believing it's happening right now. And panic, the thing that you are afraid might happen, now it's happening. You're sure that it's happening. That's the first element. And the second element is you can't escape it. You're trapped there. So that's the difference between anxiety and panic. Anxiety, maybe this will happen. I'm worried that it will. And panic, it's happening to me. But <laughs> one of the points is it's not happening. So it's imagination that's believed to be factual. And that imagination is believed to be factual because the stress hormones in the panic attack shut down the ability to do 
rational thinking and recognize that your imagination is imagination. It, it, what happens, the brain gets hijacked and the imagination is accepted as reality, although it's not. Do you find that treating anxiety is different than treating panic? No, not really. I think um, one of the things we can do just in day-to-day living to deal with anxiety is that we can train our mind every time we get revved up to get quickly revved down. And I think that's the, the key difference between people who have anxiety issues and people who don't. For example, with people I work with who have fear of flying, they know they have friends who fly just fine. So what's the difference? A person who feels profoundly secure in the world, when they get a shot of stress hormones, all it does is get their attention and immediately there's a system that downregulates that high level of arousal to just curiosity. Oh, something just got my attention. Wonder what's going on. I'm curious. What is it? So arousal at the level of alarm might just be there for a tenth of a second and quickly downregulates to just curiosity. But what happens in a person who's not so secure? When they get that feeling of alarm due to the stress hormones, they stay alarmed until the stress hormones burn off in a couple of minutes. So they stay in an anxiety-producing, anxious situation as long as the stress hormones are there because they don't have any circuitry that downregulates them. So one of the things we can do for anxiety then, and it works for panic as well. So to answer your question, yeah, we do the same thing in, in, with one part of the book, and that is, Train your mind to downregulate it every time you get zapped with stress hormones. So you can do that by first going through people you know and find someone who's really easygoing in your in your friends of your friends, someone who's not critical. And it's easy to overlook the right person because people who are so easygoing sometimes we kind of take them for granted. So you're looking for someone who's clearly they're not physically dangerous to you. But they're not even a psychological threat because they're not competitive with you. They're not judgmental with you verbally. And they're actually not even judging you at all uh, secretly. They just don't do that. Because when you're with that person, that person's face, voice, and touch sends you the maximum signals you need to activate the calming that comes from stimulating the vagus nerve. So what you can do is once you've identified this person for the next two, three, four days, every time you notice you get revved up and actually look for it so you can pick it up as soon as it happens. As soon as you get revved up, imagine your friend just walked into the room, says hello to you and comes over and gives you a hug. So do you see what we're doing? We're following arousal or alarm immediately with calming by using the three things that activate our calming system, a person's face, a person's voice, and a person's touch who's totally safe to be with. So after you've done that a few times today and tomorrow and the next day, it'll become a program so that you'll build in the automatic down regulation that you need to deal with anxiety. I like that. I like that reminder of the, you know, okay, how do we work with down regulation whenever we're not to the point of panic, you know, and then it becomes more of a a neuro pathway for us. Yeah. So now do you see, kind of go back over what we've talked about. We've talked about linking uh, oxytocin production to a situation that's, that's challenging. We've talked about linking vagal uh, breaking, poor just calls it the, the activating the vagus nerve to slow our heart rate and breathing rate. We've linked that to the challenging situation, the steps in the challenging situation. But the, the third thing we're doing now is saying we're going to cause automatic down regulation as soon as we feel revved up to automatically built in the circuitry, the programming that will calm us down to a level of curiosity. And that lets us then in a more cool, calm, and collected way, look at what the amygdala has reacted to. And so the, the amygdala may be reacting to something that's a false alarm, but if we're not calm enough, we might not be able to recognize it as a false alarm. Right, right. Yeah, such good reminders. Are you still, are you still teaching, um, you know, or helping people with regard to 
flight anxiety? Yeah, uh, fearofflying.com is my website for that, and we're very active with that. Um, I have <laughs> courses on video, and then every Wednesday night we have a group phone session. All of our courses have a, a at least a half-hour counseling session included so that we make sure that the person sets up the exercises properly. But on an ongoing basis, every Wednesday night, we have um, this free uh, group counseling. And, and listeners to your uh, podcast can also join us there if they go to fearofflying.com and look under the talk and read heading for the chat information. Wonderful. Great news. Thank you so much. Because um, I know it's a big thing for people. Very big. Very common. Well, yeah, fear of flying is, is <laughs> about one person in three has trouble with flying. And of those one in three, half of that group doesn't fly at all and half white knuckle it. Right. And what's happened with the uh, 737 Max hasn't helped it at all. Uh, it, but I'd like to just, just mention that uh, for a moment because uh, there's really nothing wrong with the 737 Max that a U.S. trained pilot would have had any trouble with. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is. It's one of those things where I think, um, you know, it's so rare, and yet when it happens, it really sticks with you. And I think it just reinforces for those of us who are anxious flyers, you know, how unsafe one can feel or out of control. I think it's also a feeling of being out of control, right? Because you're not steering it. Not that we would know how, but you know. <laughs> well, yeah. And now we talked about how another person's face, voice, and touch can calm us. See, a fortunate kid has a mom who is calm so that when the child gets upset, the mom's calming face, voice, and touch over the first couple of years of life gets built in and programs the child to be able to calm themselves automatically. But if a mom reacts in some other way when the child is upset, then it destabilizes the child. And so the people I find myself working with, with fear of flying, are people who, when they get upset, they stay upset. They don't have this automatic calming. Because they stay upset, they're on the plane, and the thought that the plane might crash becomes their reality. And turbulence is a particularly difficult time because when the plane drops, the amygdala automatically is going to release stress hormones, just as if you're up on a stepladder painting the ceiling. If you started to fall and lose your balance, the amygdala is going to zap you with stress hormones to make you forget about painting and worry about hitting the floor, which is fine. But that's just one shot of stress hormones. In the airplane, there's not just one drop. There's one after another after another. So you get one shot of stress hormones after another after another. And it builds up to the point that you get the pounding heart and the rapid breathing. And it becomes very difficult when you have these physical sensations to simply say, oh, I'm sure everything's fine. But that's not difficult for a person who has automatic downregulation. They get the stress hormones release, but it's like water rolling off a duck's back. As soon as they feel the plane drop and get a, zapped with the stress hormones for, from that particular drop, it immediately downregulates. So they they continuously downregulate. Each time the plane drops, they downregulate. And the person who has trouble with flying doesn't downregulate and gets more and more upset. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, as you were talking through it, I was just thinking of, yeah, I mean, how exactly like the the pulse goes up the you know the heart's beating fast the breath is shallow and uh, and then you know the turbulence eases and then everything's good again until the <laughs> next bump you know so yeah it's uh it's tough right especially if it's a two three four five you know or cross you know country flight <laughs> yeah and the other thing that can happen if you do go into a panicky state and do believe you're about to die the amygdala could get programmed to have a major reaction to every time you get on an airplane. There's two sets of memory cells, according to uh, Joseph Ledoux, in the amygdala. One set can, if you have a bad flight, then you have some good flights, it'll say, oh, well, forget about the bad flight. But there's another set of memory cells that, that takes longer to learn, but turbulence does last for a while. So it could learn during one flight with very bad turbulence and and the belief that you're actually in major danger. It can 
uh-huh. the program, the amygdala, once what he calls the the memory cells, uh, to never forget that getting on an airplane is dangerous. Mm. So since we can't we can't really retrain that set of memory cells in the amygdala, no matter how many good flights you have after the bad flight, you still fear the flying. So what we have to do is turn off the amygdala. How? Oxytocin. We want to have the person go to the experience of turbulence, the plane dropping, and imagine. And here we use cartoons because it's too difficult just to think about being in the plane and having turbulence. So we imagine Homer Simpson or Charlie Brown or Snoopy's on the plane and feels it drop. We want to link that to an oxytocin-producing memory. So if you could just imagine a mother nursing a child or remembering when she nursed a child and she has this cartoon there of Snoopy or Charlie Brown or someone in turbulence. So it links the cartoon character experiencing the turbulence to oxytocin production. And we want to link not only to the feeling of dropping, to the thought that are the wings going to break off or the pilot's going to lose control or even, and this is an interesting one, am I going to lose control and do something really outrageous? Which is also very common, right? Yeah, yeah. That, it's interesting because uh, most of my clients really have, are afraid they're going to go out of control, but none of them do. It's just one of those things that, that most of us are afraid we will do. Right, right. And lots of great tools in your book to help with that. Yeah, we've got, um, you know, I think we've really broken the code on how to fix panic. Hopefully now the the big challenge is getting the word out there. Right. Well, you know, my last question for you, Tom, is the name of this podcast is Tranquility Du Jour, right? So it's this idea of how do we find tranquility in the everyday, even when there's turbulence on a plane, you know, or we are in the midst of a, um, of an anxiety producing situation. And so I always like to ask my guests, how do you find tranquility in your everyday? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, our labradoodle <laughs> because when the dog jumps in the bed in the morning and it l- literally climbs on my chest and puts its arms around my neck on each side i get oxytocin so i start the day in a pretty tranquil mode and then have some coffee and take some time so you can have two things going on first you can have a s- s- lack of stress in your life hopefully there's one source of tranquility But if you do have stressors in your life, and I think that's most all of us, if we can answer it by having periods of time when we produce oxytocin, either by a a pet or uh, the person that you're with who signals you by the way they are with you to uh, activate the vagus nerve, we we can have tranquility through preventing the release of stress hormones with oxytocin by linking to some situation that produces it or either actually having a, the oxytocin producer there, such as the labradoodle, or we can link to a person's face, voice, and touch. And hopefully we have a partner in our lives whose face, voice, and touch is giving us the right kind of signals. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for writing this book and sharing your, all your insights with our listeners today. Thank you, Kimberly. You can find Tom at Facebook.com slash Panic Free Book, on Twitter at FlightWit, and YouTube, Captain Tom Bun LCSW, and it's Capt, C-A-P-T, Tom B-U-N-N L-C-S-W. So let's stay connected. You can find a link to my six books over in the show notes. I Candy, you can find me on Instagram, posting photos of snoring Yasmeho often. Follow along on Facebook, watch in YouTube, where I also have links to the new series, Tea with Kimberly. And also shop seasonless, vegan, locally made, eco-friendly fashion, Tranquility. Thank you so much for being here this week. And I wish you a delightful, delightful week ahead. Namaste.